Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. But we say that every time, but we mean it every time as well. Welcome aboard Robert Davenport, who says hello to all progressive. Paul Fleming, ATL, check it in. Hello, brother Paul. How are you doing today? AC Rodriguez. Welcome aboard, AC Rodriguez. Bridge MCP is in the house. Hey, Bridge, que paso, corazoncita. And then, of course, we have Yvette Avery Herod, one of my heroes out of Atlanta, one woman that is making changes that are going to stick. And then we have Cynthia White. She says she's listening on YouTube and hope everybody's having some fun. All right, folks, welcome to Politics Done Right. Who else am I missing? Of course, Melody Keelan is in from España, from Spain. AC Rodriguez says, ¿Cómo está, señor? Estoy muy bien porque estoy con ustedes ahora. I'm very well because I'm with you guys now. Of course I'm well. Of course I am well. Of course I am well. Continuing with the show, we've got AVQ. How you doing, AVQ? Señor Rodnin. And, of course, we have our brother, from the other side, whom we love quite very well. Eric Hayes, how you doing, Eric? Nice. To, I'm going to be seeing you in the next couple of weeks, Brother Hayes. We're going to go and have some coffee. You and uh, all of us who are going to get the posse, the, the, the Texas, well, I'm going to have to say the Harris County area, Harris County, Montgomery County, Galveston County area, uh, posse together, have some cafe. Para tener un buen tiempo allá en Houston. We're going to have some fun. All right, let's start with Michael Rodman. Will Cricket better to pardon? I have a couple long ones. Hope you have a moment to read them out. Well, yeah, I'm going to read them out quickly, but I have a great, great uh, pro, uh, person today that we're going to play. Uh, but let's do Rudnan real quick. The Atlantic. Students should refuse to go back to school despite the hopelessness after Uvalde. We are closer to understanding the kind of social movement that might actually affect gun reform. Here is where hard power comes in. One thing we learned from the pandemic is that when children aren't in school, society strains. This would make a strike an extremely powerful form of leverage. A walk out with enough students involved and taking place over days, not minutes, puts concrete pressure on officials from the municipal level to all the way up to Washington. When students aren't in school, parents have difficulty getting to work, suddenly understaffed uh, services, uh, understaffed services, uh, part of it, part of it. Parents having difficulty getting work, suddenly understaffed services, hospitals, subways suffer these consequences. Politicians and local officials have a mess on their hands. Children falling behind in learning. Parents overloaded and a strong incentive to accede to a demand. I agree wholeheartedly. And by the way, for my girl, Bridge, notice that the stuff is in front of me and I can actually read it. So, está bien, corazón, está bien. All right, common dreams, fossil fuels, addiction is sabotaging every sustainable development goal report. A first of its kind report punish, uh, published Wednesday warns that the continued extraction and burn of fossil fuels worldwide, particularly in the rich countries, most responsible for planet warming carbon emissions, is imperiling every single sustainable development goal adopted by the United Nations under states 2015. The 17 sustainable development goals are far reaching, ranging from ending global poverty to eliminating hunger to combating the climate emergency and achieving them by 2030. Wow would require ambitious and coordinated action. Sephora Berman, chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, says fossil fuel addiction poisons every earnest attempt we make to tackle the sustainable development problem. All right, folks, I got to leave that one right there. Um, please follow what Michael finishes there in the, in the link. He has a great link to it. Uh, let's see what else we have here. I think uh, Bridge has one as well. Bridge says, so, having a discussion today, and most peeps don't realize this, the NRA hates the idea of a national gun registry, but it effectively operates a massive one of its own, reports BuzzFeed. The secretive database goes away beyond its 3 million members. The group gets names from gun safety classes, gun shows, magazine subscribers, governor offices, right, Steve Freeze. It also sends requests to local police departments offering to pay for the names of permit holders. The result is powerful, big data powerhouse that rivals much vaunted one used by the Obama campaign and gives the group on parallel clout. There is nothing that prevents them from mailing these people, says former NRA lobbyist who estimates that the NRA has tens of millions of people in its database. You know, this is a very important thing you just posted there, um, Bridge. I want, and I, you know, I didn't think about that at all, but that has to, that has to enter into our discussion when whenever we talk about having registries and that sort of stuff we have to remind people that oh you don't want we the people to know all the people who have guns but you don't mind having a private entity 
that can use you without any controls from us to target you or to sell you or whatever. Breach, that's a very important find. Thank you so kindly for bringing that one to our attention. Very important piece of work that you did there. Eric Hayes says, Utopia question, why is California uh, touting cutting the budgets when they got surplus federal funds? Ah, that makes no sense. Um, I'm not going to finish that because I understand. I read it when you sent it to me uh, by itself. The idea is, you know, I mean, I, this worries me a lot with, with, with thinking, right? Think about this. The Social Security Fund was in super surplus much earlier on because it knew that come the baby boom generation, a lot of people, more people were going to be depending on it than ever, and you'd have less people paying in. So they needed to run surpluses and they needed to cut budgets and that sort of thing to make sure that when they do the analyses, the money would be there. It's not all that difficult, my dear friend. It's not all that difficult. Tom C says, hey, Egberto, thought you were going on the road this week back to Houston. No, I'm going on the road on Monday. So uh, we're going to skip uh, as ask Egberto anything this week and have it next week. I haven't programmed that in yet. Also, uh, I have some shows. Don't worry, guys. There will be shows every single day. I've already, I'm preparing them. I'm working double time to make sure that we have politics done right. The seven days a week that we do politics done right every day at 3 Central, 2. Uh, of course, on, on, on Saturdays and Sundays, it's a replay, but we have it every day. Thank you, my dear brothers, and thank you for reminding for, give, remind me to, to make this be aware. Breach from 2013, how the NRA built a massive secret database of gun owners while the National Rifle Association publicly fights against the National Register. So it's an old article. I didn't even know that. But good catch, good catch. All right, let's see what else we got here. I read if every single uh, black person bought an AR-15, there would be gun laws. <laughs> I agree with that. Ask, ask our brother Davenport. Davenport pointed that out yesterday, right? Davenport, come on, speak up now. Now, I, I, I remember everything you said. Bruce just joined the house. Welcome aboard, Bruce. How are you doing, my brother? May Wood just joined. He says, good afternoon, everyone. Tom C. says, will he, there be an Ask Egberto session this month? I just said it. We are going to have Ask Egberto every month. Sometimes we're going to have to skew it a week or so. Also, when I'm in Pittsburgh, we may have to skew it a week or so. But we are going to have Ask Egberto all of the time because it's your show, brothers. Your show. Eric Hayes says, not everyone is a member of or agrees with the NRA. That's true. Very true. And you're absolutely right, Brother Hayes. Social Security get robbed by the government. Melanie Keaton says, Tom C., next Saturday, 10th June. All right. Eric Hayes says, Egberto, why don't you finish reading things? Uh, you see, you, you're going you're gonna to give me hell just like Davenport gave me hell yesterday. I, I, I cut Rudnan short. I cut you short. I cut a piece of, uh, of, of bridge off, okay? I, I, I have to get to the interview. So, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see what's it. Okay, uh, E2247 says, U.S. Department of Defense today announced Biden sending Ukraine M142 high mobility artillery rocket system. Oh, we're going into a war because they're going to use that and they're going to hit, it, that range is I think 50 miles. They're going to hit into Russia. But anyway, folks, yesterday after our show, you know, there, we, we touched on the gun topics and good friend of mine who does some rapping, he does some poetry, he's a historian, he left a long message yesterday in our feed, and uh, I just had to read the first three paragraphs, and I said, ah, I'm going to interview you tomorrow. So I, I got a big piece out of him, and uh, his name is Tori Mercer. We are colleagues at KPFT 90.1. He's a hell of a volunteer at KPFT 90.1 FM Houston. And when he wrote that into the, into the feed, I said, we got to have him. So check out Tori, and then we'll finish the show after Tori speaks. Here we go, Tori. Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we have the honor of speaking to Tori Mercer. Tori Mercer. I always get that name wrong, but anyhow. Um, uh, Tori left a message after our show or during our show yesterday that really touched me, and it had a lot to do with the gun issues that we're all discussing. But beforehand, welcome to Politics and Right, Tori. How are you doing today? Great. It's such an honor to be on your show. I've been listening to you for years, and I just think you're the best you know especially back when kpft used to have callers that would and people would call in that just didn't agree with you at all and you were so gentle with them and you know led them through the socratic dialectic that just implied that we're all one thing we're all together you know we're all one people as opposed to some of these other political uh 
commentators that where they're just in a fight. They're just they want to draw lines between people and separate people. And you want to bring people together. And it's I mean, just that, very positive. Thank you very much for that. But that that's what I think my my call. That's what I want my calling to be. And that is that we do that because you know people are. You know, my wife used to say, people are people, and she's right. And, you know, we, we, we have more in common in just about everything than apart. And the, the powers that be, they need to keep us separated if they want to succeed in pilfering us all. But I have, first of all, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, Tori, because <laughs> I've, I've listened to a lot of your poems. I've listened to some of your sort of rap stuff. And I really enjoy what you have to bring to the political discourse. So tell people what's your background. Um, oh man, it's just, uh, it's all over the place. Uh, juvenile delinquent, uh, social studies teacher, uh, dirt bike rider, motorcycle guy, bicycle guy, um, uh, you know, working with uh, Fairly radical nonprofits. Pueblo to People was uh, my first career, uh, a nonprofit organization that worked with uh, to import things from indigenous people in Latin America for the most part. We started the fair trade coffee movement in the U.S. back when Ronald Reagan was president. We flew plane loads of Nicaragua Sandinista coffee into Canada, roasted it in Canada. And then sold it in the USA with a you know a big F U to Ronald Reagan. Uh, so we broke the embargo, and uh, and it's just been one thing after another after that. Pirate radio. We did a pirate radio pirate radio here in Houston for eighteen months. You know, eight hours a day of fresh public affairs. I mean, it wasn't just you know a bunch of kids up there you know playing their old Who records. We were. Uh, doing so and that's why we got away with it you know the fcc let us broadcast for 18 months because we were you know fulfilling uh the duty of radio mm -hmm. to inform people we had all kind of folks that were you know kpft programmers that had uh, gotten you know kicked off and um uh, they're doing public affairs they weren't making a lot of money but you know solid public affairs programmers many of which are back on the air now um, but, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, every kind of solidarity campaign, uh, in Latin America, when, you know, all the civil wars were going on down there, you know, you're from Panama, you already know what I'm talking about, exactly. Nicaragua, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, so, you know, we had solidarity campaigns here in Houston. So that's my perspective, uh, never quite fit in with, uh, you know, the hardcore Marxist Leninist kind of leftists. I was always more uh, civil libertarian oriented and uh, been still solid socialist. So, you know, uh, not a lot of people over in my camp. So I've always had to work with, uh, you know, other people, you know, uh, uh, never found a lot of right ground with right wingers, you know, haven't worked with them too much. But, you know, all my friends in Houston are lefties. And then, you know, there's the artist side of, you know, a lot of punk rockers. Uh, originally, the original punk rock scene was very attractive to me because there was a lot of political bands and it just seemed like, you know, a continuation of the social activism kind of art that was going on in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, you know, punk rock has become, you know, just another cliche like everything else. So I'm always looking for a way to plug in, uh, you know, and connect art and politics. Well, I, I know you, you've been doing a good job, car, per, car show and all these other places that you participate in. And of course, you're a historian, so um, you, you, you know a whole lot about history. But let me tell you why I really wanted to speak to you. Uh, everybody has a position on the gun debate, but I, uh, you know where I stand as far as bringing folks together, etc. I read the first part of your very long comment in our show yesterday. And before reading the entire thing, I called you up and I said... <laughs> I want you on my show today to speak a little bit about that before I read the entire thing because I could see <laughs> where it was going. And here's what you said. Countries with strong democracies have people that trust the government and feel safe. Americans left and right do not trust the government and do not feel safe. There is a direct correlation here with gun culture. How to fix America's gun problem uh, let's break it down. Both sides in the gun debate do not feel safe. Both sides are afraid. 
And when I just, that's all I read. And by the way, it's about <laughs> 20 times that length. But right, that's right. all I read. And then I said, you've got to come on to politics done right and tell us about this. Because I, I think people don't see the symmetry be between what we call the crazy right wing and what we call the very left. They all have grievances, uh, Tori, all have grievances. But there, there's something at the core there, and that is why isn't the government working for us all? So go ahead and take it away. Well, you know, um, I've been at this for a long time, and I'm, uh, like I, said, I'm, I like to use analysis. You know, I took a CIA course at, you know, history, the CIA at U of H, Thomas O'Brien, and, you know, it's all about analysis, you know, um, you know, whether no matter what you're doing in life, you know, you got to figure things out. You're an engineer, right? It's all about analysis. And uh, so I find that increasingly that, you know, the whole left and right uh, way of looking at the world just doesn't work anymore because it's the world's more complex than that. And uh, this and as you know, we become one world, you know, it gets even more complex because there's, you know, so many different political systems and philosophies. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, I don't think in terms of left and right anymore. Um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, how are we going to all kind of get on the same page? You know, we're trying to get through this dialectic, you know, we're trying to bring very disparate points of view together to be on the same page. And so um, it's, you know, a lot about listening. It's a lot about analyzing, you know, there's what people say, and then there's the subtext, you know, what does that mean in the analysis? You know, as a poet, I like to put things into metaphors. And um, when I hear the right wingers, you know, talk about gun rights, you know, and I'm not I'm thinking at the cultural level, the mass mm -hmm. level, not at the NRA level, which is basically a lobby group for the gun industry. And, you know, we know what they want, LaPierre. Mm -hmm. They just want some money and they're going to get it. And uh, uh, that's not the gun culture, okay? The gun culture is the entire country before it was a country. And, uh, you know, guns were part of our safety. You know, when back when there was this, these single shot muskets, you know, there's you know, there's wolves outside, you know, and you got to, you know, you got to go outside to go to the bathroom, you know, you got to take your gun outside with you just to go to the bathroom. You know, it's about feeling safe and guns make us feel safe. And that's from, you know, you know, the get go. And so when uh, I, I see the right wingers and we're what we call right wingers and we call gun nuts and, you know, gun culture people, you know, they're all about this. Uh, what is it? The Second Amendment? Um, uh, right to bear arms. So we got to break that down. Uh, what is that about? You know, it's not about hunting. It's about King George. And King George can represent both domestic and foreign enemies. You know, he was the king from another place, but he was also, you know, English and all the colonists were English. He was a domestic problem before he was a foreign problem. And so as a poet, I like to think of King George you know, uh, you know, he's not mentioned in the Constitution, but, you know, the Second Amendment's all about King George. And that just represents authoritarianism. You know, it represents the antithesis of the ideal. Not that we've reached the ideal, but the ideal is a demo democratic horizontal society. And King George, you know, represents authoritarianism, whether domestic, like Donald Trump, or whether foreign, like some, you know, autocratic system that might be imposed from without. And so, uh, uh, and as a civil libertarian, you know, hardcore socialist, left-wing civil libertarian, you know, I, you know, believe in vigilance. You know, also I'm a historian. And so, you know, I know that there's a lot of precedents for uh, authoritarianism to pop up. You know, whether it's, um, you know, the Red Scares, you know, from the 20s and 30s, or, you know, during the civil wars where I became uh, enculturated and politicized, the civil wars in uh, Latin America during, you know, Reagan and, you know, Bush point one. Um, I remember when there was some solid opposition to particularly what was going on in El Salvador. And, you know, this runs through the Carter administration. And there was rumors, you know, that there were detention camps being set up at military bases in the U.S., uh, four of them, 
to hold 10,000 people each in case, just in case, things really popped off and, you know, there was mass, you know, civil disobedience and rebellion against U.S. foreign policy. You know, it never, you know, got to that point, but um, it made a lot of people in the left uh, back in the 1980s think that, hey, maybe we should, uh, you know, get some guns. I never bought a gun. I've never bought a gun in my life. Um, but uh, uh, I know people that did, you know, some other hardcore lefties buying automatic weapons and, you know, riot control shotguns and crazy stuff that's even, that's illegal now. Um, um, <laughs> and uh, one communist friend of mine bought a uh, automatic shotgun and, you know, uh, blew a hole in a roof of his house. And eventually those are illegal now. He had to give it up. But, uh, you know, we need regulation on guns. I mean, there's any number of ways to fix. I, I want to stop you right there, uh, Tori, for one thing, because what you've just showed me there is that you've showed that during the times where many on the left feel a certain level of threat, that amazingly, their response wasn't all that different than some of these guys on the right, even though you and I know that their fear is really a false fear, but sure. that reaction was there. Yeah, I mean, it's like people need to trust their government. You know, what's the difference between the USA and countries that have a lot of guns uh, that, you know, or, you know, don't have a lot of guns, doesn't even matter, but, you know, democracies that people were, you know, think Nordic countries where people trust their government, mm -hmm. you know, things, you know, it's not just, a, it doesn't start with the gun issue and it doesn't start with the gun culture. It starts with social safety net, right. you know, people feeling safe. You know that they're gonna be able to get uh, a place to live and food and education and medical care and care when they're old and care for their children you know just a sense of safety you know we don't have that in the usa people and, you know <laughs> i wanted to interrupt for one reason because you know we, we we give the right a hard time now justifiably but the the parts of the right that we seem to me we really should give a hard time is the leadership that is that that's forcing that false narrative into those on the right to believe their culture is being usurped when we've always had a multicultural system, just that others are being empowered now, that somehow something is being taken away from them, that, that their birthright is being taken away from them, when many a times the converse is true. Isn't that right? Yeah, I mean, we're always, we're constantly battling the past. Right. And, you know, that's sort of the essence of the conservative mo movement in the U.S. It starts with the Voting Rights Act and uh, the Civil Rights Act in 1964. You know, like black people are going to vote. Oh, my gosh. I mean, that, you know, triggered the biggest shift in this country. You know, all those, you know, uh, Klansmen from the 1930s and uh, other folks that supported the New Deal and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I mean, they were the Democratic Party in the South. Mm -hmm, the KKK right. ran the Southern Democratic Party. And it, you know, you know, to, you know, here's our analysis, you know, it made the New Deal possible. And right. when, you know, a lot of those Klansmen didn't go away by the 1960s, when they were still Democrats, but they left the Democratic Party and went and became Republicans mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, their world was shifting into a, a new thing. They weren't used, and they just weren't ready for it. Right. And, uh, uh, they weren't ready for the new world and they wanted to conserve the old, you know, stratified, you know, social system where there's a subclass, you know, people that were below the constitutionally protected, you know, legal system. Yeah, I like I like the way that you brought in and uh, you remember I said I only read your first part, which is what I wanted to discuss and then how you brought in Chile and all the things that happened with Pinochet and Allende. What I really want to talk about right. now is what do you see as a solution with uh, the gun issues, with gun regulations, etc.? How do you see a solution that both the left and the right will accept? Well, there's two fixes. One is very long term and it's a cultural fix. And it has to do, and we don't even start with guns. You start with providing people everything they need to feel safe. You know, the social safety net, you know, from cradle to grave. And, um, you know, it's a little more difficult here in this incredibly class stratified society that's multicultural. You know, it's a lot easier here than it is in Switzerland. Okay. I mean, it's just like, that's a long-term fix. 
Okay, the short-term fix is to uh, basically satisfy the needs, you know, the deep needs, what we would call the subtext of both of these sides, you know, the right-wingers, we call them, or the gun nuts, and, you know, the, you know, progressives or just, you know, people that are afraid to send their kids out of their house because, you know, they, you know, they go to church or to school or to the mall and the kids are going to get shot, you know, so uh, how do we, you know, deep listen to both of these sides and come up with some kind of legal solution as opposed to a cultural solution. And so, um, you know, when I hear, you know, the right wingers, because, you know, um, I think that's who, you know, people on the progressive left need to listen to the most because, you know, we're too busy listening to ourselves and we understand what that problem is. We understand what our needs are, but in order to get to the solution and move this ball down the field, we need to, you know, do some deep analysis of the right, you know, and I'm not talking about, you know, the gun lobby and these people that are just exploiting the chaos because there's no end to, you know, people that will exploit chaos for profit. They're not going to go away. But the people that are really concerned, you know, like these, you know, kind of right wing veterans that listen to Fox, Fox News and uh, they've uh, been in the military, they've uh, uh, sworn an allegiance to the Constitution and, uh, you know, they might not be scholars. So I'm kind of energy, you know, kind of. You know, interjecting a little bit here, but, you know, they're afraid of King George, you know, to use a metaphor. They're afraid of, you know, back in the 50s, it was, oh, the communists are going to take over the government, you know. And then uh, now it's like, uh, you know, now Bernie Sanders is going to take over the government. You know, who knows? You know, these, you know, their analysis isn't great, but, you know, they're basically, it comes back to a legal position of defending, uh, you know, using the Constitution, uh, which has its good points and bad points, but using that Second Amendment to basically say, you know, we need to be aware of authoritarianism. We need to be aware of overreach by, you know, our government or any other government, you know, and, you know, what they're really afraid of is gun confiscations, you know, doing something that's outside of their will and um, having a gun registry. Okay, so uh, how do we, you know, get to a safe place and satisfy the progressives on the left and uh, have satisfy everybody, the people on the right. How do we, you know, get to a point where we have background checks and, you know, safety uh, insured, you know, that somebody knows how to use a gun, it's not mentally unstable. Um, how do we do that without having a gun registry? And it's just not that complicated. You know, this isn't rocket science. You know, um, and it has to do with what I call a gun purchasing license. OK, so, you know, it's like we have all kind of other licenses that uh, people need to acquire whenever they want to do anything. It's all about a level of trust. Right. You know, whether you're going to teach children or do brain surgery, you have this license, you know, to do electricity, whatever. Um, you know, it says that, you know, you were allowed to go out and do this job. And because we trust you, that's a license and that's the legal thing. OK, we just need to separate that license uh, that, you know, says we trust you to use a gun. We need to separate that from the actual purchase of a gun. OK, now people that sell guns have those licenses. I mean, people that have, uh, you know, gun stores, you know, they have to get a license from the government that says, you know, we trust you to sell these guns. And they have to, like, you know, do their due diligence and, uh, um, you know, make sure they're not, you know, doing illegal things with their guns, you know, selling them to, you know, overseas or whatnot. Um, and so just uh, it's that simple. Uh, we separate the license to buy a gun from buying a gun. You know, you get a license to drive a car doesn't it mean your car just is registered. You don't have to buy a car. You just need, you know, you get a license to drive. The government says, we trust you to drive a car. And uh, then imagine if when you went to buy a car, you had to show that license. And you can't buy a, a car without a license that shows, you know, you can drive safely. But there's no connection between the purchase of the car and the license. You know, you're not registered. Um, and so that's how a, 
a, a gun purchasing license would work. It would basically just extend the license from a gun dealer to a gun owner, uh, except, um, you know, there's no connection. You, you know, by law, the gun uh, sellers, you know, would not be able to register you as the purchaser of the gun. If I understand your concept is, but you have to qualify for the license, which means that license would make sure that you're mentally competent, that you haven't beaten your wife, that you haven't done all of these things. And once you prove that you're a responsible citizen, you have a license to go out there and buy weapons. The part that you didn't cover in your article is what about weapons of war? Do you want to, we should prohibit the sale of those in your, in your uh, phase or, or what? Yeah, I don't think that, uh, you know, the ultimate concept is safety, you know, so we want guns to make us feel safe, you know, and, you know, I mean, I don't want one, but that's why a lot of people want them. And so, you know, to protect your house, you know, from a burglar or whatever invading, um, you know, you probably need a small pistol, uh, if you may be a shotgun, the problem with these, you know, AR-15s, these high powered weapons, you know, isn't that they have, you know, magazines that shoot, shoot 30 shots. The problem is the size of the bullet. I mean, right. these things are huge. They yeah. will go through three brick houses in right. your neighborhood. So you're trying to stop the guy that's getting in your backyard. Sure. Okay. Let's say you shoot him and you stop him and then it goes through, uh, it goes you know, through go, him and kills somebody else. It goes through the wall of your house and it goes through the wall of the, you know, the two brick walls of the next house. And then it goes through the two brick walls of the next house. I mean, it's not the right tool for the job. You know, My I mean, question to like, you then is, in, as, in as much as you're saying this part is easy, there's a small fringe that I don't think would like the idea that I think you're coming to a conclusion of. And that is we probably shouldn't allow the sales of weapons of war like the AR-15. Well, uh, just like, you know, every other tool that you buy at Home Depot, we need our tools to be safe. You know, we don't need them hurting people and, you know, that don't need to be hurt. I mean, yeah, I mean, you might want to shoot the burglar or whoever rapist coming in your house. But, uh, you know, you can do that with just a small weapon. You know, right. uh, you don't need a weapon that will, you know, penetrate a tank. <laughs> I think if, if people learn how to bifurcate the discussion uh, as you did, you know, meaning uh, you, you, you still allow abstraction of owning a gun to some extent, but at the same time, you know, you have to say we won't allow you to own a bazooka or AR-15. I don't, I, I think that's a better sell once we get control away from the NRA, but we are coming up close on time uh, right now uh, to Sorry, so let me ask you to give me a quick one minute closing statement here. Yeah, ultimately, uh, it's not a legal fix. It's a cultural fix. You know, we need people to feel safe. We want we don't want anybody to have guns, including the police or the military or the civilians. You know, we want a peaceful world where, you know, there's a horizontal democracy, one person, one vote, not some stranglehold on power like a, 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 which a republic is. You know, we need to move beyond our constitution. We need a better constitution. We need to fix our culture. You know, everything is south of the culture. You know, every all kind of politics, economics, everything is a subset of culture. So that's the long term goal is to change the culture. And, you know, and we're ahead of everybody else. I mean, it's easy enough to fix a culture in Sweden or Denmark where it's mostly monocultural. I mean, you know, we're ahead of the curve. We're multicultural and that's a good thing. There's a lot of advantages to that, but you know, there's, you know, the issues. And so uh, we have to fix those as we go along and it's up to us because, you know, we are the world's leading multicultural, you know, mm -hmm. place. And so we got to do it. And here we are doing it. <laughs> Sorry, Mercer. Uh, thank you so kindly for having been on, on, on a uh, politics done right. And I tell you something, sir, that last, there you go, buddy. There you go. That that's last my group, statement, Extinction Rebellion. That's what I'm I doing know, now. Been, I know that's what you are, brother. That last statement is present. Thank you so kindly, Terry. Cheers, mate. I really love that guy. Before I get started, I want to thank you wonderful people. Alistair Waters, thank you so kindly for that wonderful super chat. She says, drinking my coffee and wanting to share the love. You've shared the love. Also, we have... 
Robert Davenport, two times Robert Davenport in, he, you know, he, he, he tried to get into a competition with, with uh, Bridge MCP. Actually, I think Bridge is the one who's been the one trying to create a competition. I love Bridge. Robert Davenport, thank you so kindly for being a solid supporter of politics done right always. Likewise, we have Bridge MCP. She says, proud as Rob, but had to beat him. Much love. You know, this is all for fun. She's having fun. Davenport, look, thank you guys for the love. Thank you guys for the love. Hey, um, uh, Tori ended something that I want to jump on before I do my the video for the books and all of that, because he said something important. He said, Sweden and all these places, they're almost monocultural. In other words, they're, they're mostly one, you know, a, a huge preponderance of one kind of folk. America, we have, you got to love America. We have problems. We do. But what he said, I wish more of us understood. The complexity of dealing with people from all over the world, all different cultures. Uh, we have not really... In the, in, in, the, in the whole ethos of things, if you listen to Tori, and I, I, I am with him there, we have not done so badly as we move forward. And yes, we've taken two steps backwards with the clown that we hired as our president. And yes, we have a problem that we have to solve right now. But we have to be positive to note that it is us who have to make the difference. In other words, we can't cede... We can't cede to the, to the supremacists of whatever type. We can't cede to them. We have to be the ones who make the continual progress. You know how Obama used to say that, uh, and he, you know, uh, I have issues with Obama sometimes, but what he says is so true. It's difficult to turn a juggernaut, but also the arc of progress moves in one direction if you make it so. And I don't, you know, I never get it right. Welcome aboard to my dear, beautiful Rose William. I hadn't seen you before, and I'm going to go through those messages in a minute. Let me go ahead and play our uh, book video, ask, a few, uh, ask for some don donors, and then we'll get back into the program, go through all your messages. Okay, here we go. I'm Berto Willis, as host of Politics Done Right, a progressive radio media show on Pacifica Networks, KPFT 90.1 FM Houston, that engages all ideologies. I found that our political angst isn't mostly ideological. There is a well-designed effort by many in power to control us. If we are at each other's throats, we are less likely to demand our economic and local wishes. In that light, I wrote three books. I wrote the first one titled, As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom to Describe the Entire Economy in a Manner We Can All Understand. It highlights why it was designed to pill for most as it empowers a few, the chosen. The second book, titled, It's Worth It, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors, Take It to the Next Level. After understanding how the system pilfers, it is incumbent that we can speak to our peers to empower a change. The third book, How to Make America Utopia, Take Away the Economy from Those Who Rigged It, gives us a place to land. After learning about our economy that is dysfunctional for most and learning how to engage the other side, we point out what would make an economy that works for all. Each book stands on its own, but together they provide the full picture. Please consider getting one or more. You will undoubtedly learn, be entertained, and help us continue the mission with our blogs, articles, videos, and books. I'm Egberto Willis. Absolutely so. So please uh, hear the link to the books. There it is in the feed. Politicsandright.com slash books. Politicsandright.com slash books. Please consider uh, getting it. You can also support us on Patreon politicsdoneright.com slash patreon. Some people like to give at patreon. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N, politicsdoneright.com slash patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Likewise, you can support us by joining YouTube. Click that join button on YouTube and become a part of our PDR Posse on YouTube. You can also support us. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not on YouTube on another network, just go to politicsandright.com slash YouTube, politicsandright.com slash YouTube. That gives you the opportunity to join us as well. Likewise, the best form to support us is however you will on PayPal if you so desire, politicsandright.com slash PayPal. Or you can do what Bridge MCP, Davenport, and Alistair Waters did, and that is provide us with some super chats to keep it going. Those super chats are going into the tank to get this bill, to, to get all this stuff back out to Houston. So thank you so kindly. You guys are some wonderful 
people. Uh, let's continue. The, don't forget our store. We have a lot of new stuff at the store, people. Please go to politicsandright.com slash store. My brothers and my sisters, politicsandright.com slash stores. Get the t-shirt. Oops, I, am I blocking it? Did I block that? Let's see if I can show it. Show the t-shirt, Politics and Right. We have all, and this is not the only design. You have other designs as well for Politics and Right, for the T, for the cap, all that good stuff. Check it out. You're going to like it. Again, thank you very much, Alistair Waters. Thank you very much, Bridge MCP. Thank you very much, Robert Davenport. And Robert Davenport did it twice. Thank you so kindly, my brother. All right, let's go ahead and continue answering your question. Did I forget a link that I, oh, the all-encompassing link to provide a support is at politicsandright.com slash support, politicsandright.com slash support. All right, hermanos y hermanas, thank you so kind. Let's go ahead and get back to, before I get to the questions again, I have another video you must see. I talk about one of the reasons people don't, um, they don't understand their government is because the media is not doing the job that it should do, right? And last night, I was downstairs at my daughter's apartment, and I'm just going ahead. I'm, I'm preparing the shows for Friday, Monday, and Tuesday, right? So I, I got the interviews done, and I'm, I'm cutting it and turning it into a show that's going to go live. And I hope I'll be able to interact as I, you know, as Lou Drive or something like that. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm listening, and I'm doing my work. I'm doing my work. And what happens? I hear... Uh, it turns out that something is going wrong with uh, this thing. Is, is it freezing? Is everybody freezing? I don't think so. I hope not. I hope not. I, th I still see it running on, on, on my, my thing here. So I hope it's not freezing. But anyhow, as it turns out, do a refresh uh, uh, breach. So here's what happened. I start to hear something about, oh, my God. Uh... This guy doesn't understand the Senate. This guy doesn't understand the Constitution. And the funny thing is that people would believe what he's saying and then don't hold it against the politicians for what they do. So check this out. We'll take it on the other side. Oops, I got to get it right here. Here we go. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. Times correspondent Peter Baker has to know better. He has to know that what he's saying is crap. Do you want to know why Americans are misinformed? I want you guys to listen to this, and then we'll take it on the other side. Because when I saw this, I pretty much erupted. Because it may, it gives the Senate an excuse for its, its in, in Spanish, su, su behavior that's pessimo. But anyhow, check this out, and then we'll take it on the other side. In terms of is something going to really get done here, is this talk for real? Yeah, it's a good question. Look, the Senate is designed by the Constitution to avoid exactly the kind of rush to legislation that we're talking about. They are designed, it is designed as an institution to avoid, uh, you know, a, a quick response to popular outrage. Uh, the, the founders believed that there was something valuable in that. But obviously in today's political environment, there's a great frustration with that, a frustration that doesn't just slow things down to give it some thoughtful consideration, but it slows things down forever to never get anything done. We that statement is ridiculous, completely ridiculous. The reality is the filibuster. There is nothing constitutional about the filibuster. The filibuster is not a part of the Constitution. It's a part of the rules that the Senate, among themselves, decided to create. So the slowness of the Senate has nothing to do with the founding fathers. It has everything to do with the Senate creating some rules to obstruct. Let's be clear here, okay? The Senate is an undemocratic institution by design. That's what the founders did. They made sure that irrespective of how big a state was, it actually just got two senators. That is completely undemocratic. But don't blame the inability of the, the Senate to work with 51 votes to get anything passed. Be something that the founders did to slow things down or make things more difficult. The only thing that the founders did was with the Senate was to make an undemocratic body that made sure that big landowners with little populations had the same amount of power as big urban areas in large states. That's all. Nothing more. The, the, the Senate is broken not by, not because of the founders in this particular case, but because the Senate decide that they want to stay broken. Democrats have the power to change it, and they won't. When Republicans get the power, they will.
and that is what we better recognize. Right now, the, the Republicans will take the power they need to attain the goals they're attempting to attain. When they needed the Supreme Court justices, when they needed to steal Supreme Court justices, what they did, they changed the filibuster rule. And they will change it again for everything that's needed going forward, one piece at a time. And as Democrats try to play, uh, play games, they will fail royally. Okay, I'm going to start going back up to see what people have been talking about. Rose Williams, I hope I, I said hi. Let's see what else I got here from the top. Alistair Waters, way to go. This what That came from Davenport. Thank you, Alistair. Paul Fleming says, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing our most of the Republican governors are shifting the conversation away from guns to mental illness uh, and in, in which they all cut budgets on mental health. Thank you for realizing that, Paul. It's so important. If you just base getting a weapon of war on mental health, all of the shooters, but one would have been able to get a gun. It's a cop-out. It's more than a cop-out. Again, other country, no other country has this problem, and that's because they have good regulation. So very good catch on that as usual. It's not about it's not about mental illness, it's about the availability of weapons of war. And that's what we need to call them, weapons of war. We are at the half point, Paul said, and I just did the piece for that, my dear brother. All right, what else have we got here? Cynthia White says, Bridge MCP, my Chromebook doesn't play nice with Duck, uh, Duck, Duck Go or Firefox. These corporations need to stop anti-competitive behavior. They do. They do. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Alice Waters said, I truly love and appreciate you all. We appreciate each other, and that's why we are a family here every day, every day. Hey, um, I need to ask uh, everybody right now, because I don't know if there may be some changes coming that I may need to uh, see how I, I navigate with respect to hours or whatever. So, I mean, all, all of you that listen to the show, I would love to know all the different windows in which you would listen to the show. You know, you guys are the posse. Tell me what, which, what are the time windows of the day that you would listen to Politics Done Right? Because I, am, I may have to make some adjustments and uh, if, if, if I, if, if, depending on what I do, it'll, it'll just be double time. But I'm trying to merge certain things together. So please, uh, if info at politicsandright.com, say, hey, I'll listen this time, this time, this time. Let me know what, what your thoughts are, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, Bridge MCP says, AR-15s can de de decapitate a person as seen by the coroner in Houston, uh, rather in Texas. Machiavellian ethic of the ends justify the means as typified today by whatever is taxi. Mantras dose to, uh, to us hourly is a real vicious model of thought killing us daily. E2247, you kind of gave tongue tied me there, but I think I finally got it out. Every case says the guy is from another planet on abolishing things, have a realistic perspective. Uh, Rose says, must be catching. I'm having connection issues also. Come on, folks. Let's make sure that America finally gets some good cable, good fiber. Bree says, when I was buying a gun for safety, I asked my neighbor, Vietnam vet, and uh, had many guns. He said, only a shotgun. You get a rifle and it will cut through your house, my woods and into my house. No need for that for home safety. You know, you, you wonder why, why these people do what they do. Brice says, thank you. Had many good things to say. Thank you very much uh, for liking that, Brice. Uh, Brice MCP also said, agree, may would he didn't start the fire. Alistair Waters says, is Tori Mercer in close proximity to us, Egberto? Yes, Tori is actually a member at, a, at a KPFT. He's a volunteer at KPFT. Uh, you know, I, 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 if you take a look at my website, EgbertoWillis.com, and look Tari Mercer up, you can see him doing a, he did a great poem on capitalism. Check it out and tell me what you guys think about it. Uh-oh, uh-oh, we got another super chat. I can't get it onto the screen yet, but I, brother, <laughs> brother Davenport threw in another 11 bucks. So I think brother Davenport decided I'm going to get everybody beat. So he's at 50. I mean, hey. I love all of you guys for what you're doing, guys. Just, just know that. Just know that. I appreciate that. That, 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 that helps out with us getting heading back to Houston. You guys are great people. All right, continuing, 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 continuing. So yes, Alistair, he's there. And by the way, Alistair, you're in Conroe. You are in Conroe. Eric is in Eric is in Kingwood. Lou, of course, is in is in uh, is in Houston. 
and all of you that are in the Houston area, we are not only going to go to coffee sometime, we're going to just all of us meet up at the KPFT 90.1 FM studio. And we'll go in there and sit down in the studio itself. They're building it out right now. We'll go into the studio. And, and, and I, tell you what, I, I tell you this other offer to other folks in my posse. If you guys are anywhere in the area, whenever we're doing politics done right in studio, I'm not talking about when I do it in my home studio, but when I do it at the studio at KPFT, you always, you will always be invited to come into the studio with me. We are real community radio. It's a, it's a hundred thousand watts. It's huge. And by the way, I'm now on the Pacifica Network National Board, so although it's very difficult, but yeah. Uh, so here, here's the deal. Any of you, you know, I mean, if it, if it got too big, I'll probably throw ten of you at the same time into the room. But um. But that is what it's all about. You are politics done right. So we'll be able to do that whenever you can. Peggy Lopez, I hope I saluted you from my youth. I have seen numerous advances in making more inclusive citizenship in America. Much more to do. This change is what gives me hope for our collective future. Great inclusiveness. And that's what I'm saying, uh, uh, Peggy. I want us to not look at things as how bad America is. America is racist. America is sexist. America is homophobic. Look. I came to America homophobic and sexist. I can tell you that I've lost both of those two genes, okay? And if you doubt it, uh, you know, in, in some organizations, they've actually made me an honorary woman. Ha! Huh? Amazing, huh? But yeah, so, so, uh, so let, let me just say, we can all lose our prejudices. It takes some time. Some of it has to be intellectual. Some of it is intellectual that has to work into the heart. That is where it's like muscle memory, right? You got to get there. But that requires you to do the work yourself. So uh, if you are a right-wing racist, there, it's not an end for you. You can still, whoa, I just got me. Peggy Lopez just gave us a super chat. I will put those on for tomorrow, guys. Peggy Lopez just gave a super chat for $20. Thank you so kindly, uh, Peggy Lopez. Hey, you guys are fighting for these numbers. You guys are going to make my, my trip to Houston a lot easier, man. You guys are great. Anyhow, um, so, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. I lost my train of thought. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up with what I'm trying to say about our society as a whole. Oh, I know what I was talking about. I was talking about losing your prejudices. It's not, it is not hard. Actually, it is hard. It is hard to lose your prejudices from the inside. Intellectually, it is not hard at all, right? Intellectually, we know that biologically speaking, we are all so damn similar. I always use the, when I wrote my book, uh, uh, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors, I gave the case where there's this black guy, this white woman, and this black guy could give his heart to her and her sister couldn't give it to her. So that is how complex and similar humanity is. So when people try to make humanity as something like, uh, oh, it is so like we're, no, 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 no. Pigmentation and quality and, and, and size of lip and size of nose and no nose or having big butt, no butt, all that kind of stuff. Attributes. Attributes that don't define humanity. And when we learn those things, when we learn all those things, we get to appreciate it all. And that is what I'm trying to preach. And what I say about America we can dog America because it's ours. America is ours to dog to make it better. But America is actually the good place. You know, I, I, I hear the British come. You know that guy who uh, gave, gave uh, Cruz a hard time? Why is America so exceptional? Well, you know, Cruz is so, so silly himself. He should be able to say, we, we need to learn from the rest of the world how to deal with guns. But where are we exceptional? In most countries? A foreigner cannot become a citizen. In most countries, a uh, most countries in the Western world have yet to elect a Barack Obama. There's a lot of things we can say because, as bad as things are, there are good things as well. And if you sit down and analyze these things, you see it's not all about. Whoops! I'm letting things go by, don't, aren't I? Uh, thought I would join in the race. Thank you, Peggy Lopez. Peggy Lopez also said Pacific time, except 9.30 to 11.30. That is between my times. Uh, that will be 11.30 to 2.30. Okay, got you, girl. I got you. Oh, that. well, we'll see about that. Uh, but let's see what else we got. Robert says, whenever I follow progressive women, I feel sure I'm going to 
in the correct direction. Bridge MCP, Alistair Waters. You bet your life on that. But Bridge would put you in your place. Let me just tell you that. You you can you can you can you can muck around and 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 tell Bridge anything now. She'll knock you out. Uh, let's see who else we got here. Alistair Waters says you are awesome, Robert Davenport. And Alistair also said we do need to come together as Americans. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I stand for. I get a lot of hits. It's funny because I get a lot of hits from all sides, right? From the right and the left. The left thinks I appease the right too much, right? Some of you that are listening to me right now, you think sometimes, like, Berto, you're giving the right wing people too much time. And I'm like, please help me, guys. Help me. Help me. And some on the right says, oh, you just always, you're just a pink old liberal that don't. You guys get it. What I really want to do is I really want us to be one team. And we have all on the team here. Hey, guys, you guys made my day. Uh, thank you so kindly for all those contributions. You know, I have a long trip to make this week. So, I mean, that does help quite a bit. So I appreciate you for all of you who continue to support politics and right in whatever form you do so. Because you know what? It is together we are going to get this work done. And don't, don't, don't think what you're doing isn't working. A lot of people say, are you spinning your wheels? And I'm like, yeah, planting seeds. A seed don't grow right away. You know, I, you know how I know it's working? When I get emails, I've, I've never, the, the, the one that was most profound to me, and I, then I got to get out of here. The email I got that was most profound was when I was talking about the Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act. This particular woman was not in Texas, which doesn't have the expansion. She was in a state who had the Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act, but she was a Republican, a conservative, who also liked to watch my show. Bridge says, Egberto Willis, when you take peeps all meet up, I want to see a pic saluting the PDR peeps. You bet I'm going to do that. Uh, so uh, so she, she was a Republican. She, her son was sick. I don't remember what psychological problem. I don't remember what kind of problems he had. I think I have it in one of my books. But anyway, I, I told her, oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. You qualify for insurance for your kid, the, this expansion to the Affordable Care Act. She knew nothing about it because all she listened to was politics and right or right wing stations. Okay. And she sent me a letter, told me after my show, she went and, and, and did what we spoke about. And she said she was in tears. She was in tears. Now, I am not asking people to become Democrats, to become progressives or anything like that. But in this woman's case, she did. I was just telling her to, to vote her interest and do what she needs to do to take care of her son. And she did. So that's what it's all about. And that's why we do what we do. Anyway, my name is Egberto Willis. Anybody that I miss get into, woohoo, Ashley Willis on her boards. Yes, we are doing, we are, we're, we're willing Ashley Willis on those boards. She's going to kick its butt. That's what she's going to do. So, yes, folks, thank you very much, Bridge. And, Bridge, you gave some very good words of encouragement on these different threads. You are a godsend. You guys are godsend. Thank you so much. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right, and you guys know how I end this, baby. I am what? We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please 